Nearly two centuries ago, when archaeology was in its infancy, legend and myth formed part of our picture of the ancient past. Ageless stories, some handed down from a time before written records, told of heroes and villains, gods and monsters, mysteries and marvels. But how much of what these stories told was true? Were the legends that shaped our view of prehistory fact or merely fiction? Explorers and historians began to turn to the clues that lay buried in the ground. They started to dig for the truth. Their search became the story of archaeology. The quest began in Egypt, the enchanted land where, nearly 200 years ago, archaeology was born. Napoleon's victory over the Ottoman Empire had opened up Egypt to Europeans for the first time in centuries. Travelers flocked to explore the wonders preserved in the baking desert sands and to find for themselves the relics of this mighty past. Encouraged by their success, they dug and dug but too often they were distracted by the splendor of what they found. Understanding the Egyptian past came a poor second to collecting artifacts. Many long-held assumptions about Egyptian history went unchallenged. Now, more than a century and a half later, science is casting new light on some of those long-held beliefs. When the Greek writer Herodotus visited Egypt in the 5th century BC, he was told how armies of slaves had labored for 20 years to build the Great Pyramid at Giza. He recorded what he heard, and in the absence of any other explanation, 19th and 20th century archaeologists accepted his account as fact. Archaeologist Dr. Zawi Hawass leads a team of scientists currently working on perhaps the most iconic symbols of ancient Egypt, the pyramids. He has been grappling with one of the great unanswered questions, how these massive structures were built. In the 1980s, during routine construction work at Giza, a mechanical digger struck a stone. The stone turned out to be part of an ancient wall. This is a very important wall called the Wall of the Crow. And it is the oldest limestone wall ever built. It's about 10 meters high, 30 feet high, and the length of it is about 600 feet. <laughs> The discovery of the Crow Wall, as it became known, provoked a new question. Why had it been built so close to the Giza Pyramid? The answer brought Dr. Hawass the evidence he had dreamt of. For the wall turned out to be part of a site that had once housed those very people who, more than 4,000 years ago, had built the pyramid at Giza. But for Zawi Hawass, more crucial than the ruined city was his discovery of the tombs where the pyramid builders had been laid to rest. These were not the treasure-filled tombs of royalty, but they promised something just as precious. Undisturbed, they still held within them rare and vital clues to the lives of these long-dead Egyptians. For the first time, an evidence of the people who actually built the pyramids Within the tombs, the finds exceeded all expectations. There was pottery from the time of the 4th and 5th dynasty, 
four and a half thousand years old. Statues brought the pyramid builders vividly to life. But the picture emerging from within the tombs wasn't tallying with the accepted account of a workforce of captive slave laborers. As the excavation continued, Dr. Hawass discovered a series of well-preserved wall inscriptions. The inscriptions here, every word here, can tell us about names of the people, what they do, and even sometimes they really show to us for the first time what kind of work they did. The hieroglyphs describe the working lives of the pyramid builders. They tell of a comfortable, relatively prosperous domestic life, tending animals, brewing beer, and making bread. Dr. Howes suspected that the pyramid builders were not the poor, browbeaten slaves of legend, but skilled artisans, professionals, and craftsmen. More evidence was to come, but from an unexpected quarter. Skeletons from the tombs were sent for routine scientific analysis. One skull revealed that a brain tumor had been surgically removed and that the patient had survived a further two years. And when there were accidents on the site, broken bones had been carefully set, damaged limbs surgically amputated. Medical treatment of this kind had only previously been seen in the skeletons of royalty and nobility. The health of these workers was clearly well looked after, with a level of care that would not have been lavished on slaves. The bones had yet another secret to reveal. From fragments of 4,000-year-old bone, scientists were able to extract samples of DNA. As more skeletons were found, the samples were compared. By piecing together the DNA evidence, the team were able to show that the pyramid builders were related to each other. Living in family groups, mothers, fathers, and children and cousins were all working together on the project. For Hawass, all the new evidence added up to one conclusion. The pyramid was the national project of the whole nation. Every family in the south and the north used to participate in this uh, building a pyramid by sending workforce to help the king. The revelation that the pyramids were built not by slaves but by groups of committed artisan families challenged one of the most ancient stories about the building of the pyramids. And another of the long accepted legends was about to crumble. Herodotus had described the pyramid builders maneuvering the three million stone blocks into place, and he'd put the number of workers needed as 100,000. But excavations at the Giza site revealed that the city had only housed a maximum of 20,000 people. So how could so few people have performed such an incredible feat? The answer lay not in Egyptian archaeology, but in science, and the inspiration of a civil engineer from Cambridge University in England. Dr. Dick Parry has always been fascinated by the construction of the pyramids. You can't help but stand in the shadow of the pyramids to think, how did they construct these things? For Parry, the traditionally accepted ideas about pyramid building 
simply didn't add up. In particular, no one had been able to explain to him how gigantic blocks of stone had been raised to the top of what were, for 43 centuries, the tallest structures on Earth. Remnants of sloping ramps have been found at the sites. Could sleds have been used to haul the stones up these ramps? But sleds would only work on very gentle slopes, which would mean very long ramps. A steeper gradient would be more efficient, but the angle would seem to rule out sleds. So, how was it done? A clue was to come from ancient relics hidden away in a long forgotten cabinet in the Cairo Museum. Found near pyramid sites, these are 4,000 year old miniature replicas of workmen's tools. There are sextants for measuring blocks, hammers for chiseling stone. But this model had the experts baffled. No one could work out what it was for. It was quite apparent to me that they were quarter circles. And if you take four quarter circles and put it around a stone, then you have a cylinder. Parry designed scale models to test how sleds and cradles would perform, pulling stones up steep slopes. I think even the most ardent sled fans would have to agree that it's unrealistic to try and pull a sled up a slope much steeper than one in ten. Whereas if you are rolling a heavy object, you can roll it up a ramp of, say, one in four. The device effectively transformed the load itself into a wheel. It was an ingenious solution, but would it have worked in practice? In this reconstruction, stone blocks and ramps were used to simulate the task. Sleds were not a success. But using giant wooden replicas of the cradle, Parry and a Japanese crew managed to roll a 2.5 ton piece of concrete up a one in four slope, 15 meters long, in less than a minute. Using the circular cradles, the stones could have been raised by fewer people and the work would have been done much faster. A city of 20,000 workers would have been more than enough to build the Great Pyramid at Giza. Archaeologists are adjusting their images of ancient Egypt as they discover that time-honored sources may not always be as reliable as they seemed. But elsewhere, ancient accounts have proved a more useful tool. As interest in the ancient past quickened, early archaeologists turned their attention to another of the world's great civilizations, Greece. The Greek civilization yielded one of the richest bodies of literature in the world. Homer, Plato and Plutarch wrote not only of their own times, but of events reaching back almost two millennia. The Greek stories told of kingdoms and quests, heroes and villains, fantastical tales where gods came to earth and mortals defied nature. The author Homer, in his famous Odyssey, writes of an island ruler, Minos, who rules over a prosperous Mediterranean kingdom. But the king's palace held more than royal riches. It housed a monster, the Minotaur. Half man, half bull, the Minotaur lived in a subterranean labyrinth. And each year, King Minos was said to make an offering to the beast, a human sacrifice. The story intrigued a young English museum curator called Arthur Evans. He believed that Greek legends were rooted in history and that somewhere King Minos, his palace, and perhaps even his Minotaur had really existed. But by the end of the 19th century, other scholars had become disillusioned with the ancient stories. 
Myth, they concluded, should not lead science, and Homer should not guide archaeology. Evans did not share their skepticism. He had been inspired by ancient seals coming from the Greek island of Crete. They were carved on semi-precious stones and bore inscriptions that were both unique and perplexing. Evans bought some land at Knossos, a part of Crete known to be of archaeological interest. In 1900 he started to dig, looking for the source of those enigmatic seals. Almost at once he found buildings, walls and artifacts. Soon a whole complex had begun to emerge. Evans had made an astonishing discovery, one that placed him at the forefront of archaeology. He had found an ancient city, and he was convinced that it was the home of Homer's fabled King Minos. Part of the complex was clearly a palace, and within it, Evans made another find, a throne room. To Evans, this was the final proof, the throne of King Minos himself. There was so much on the site to take in. The ruins were revelatory. They didn't fit with anything previously discovered. Everything about them was distinctive. Evans had discovered a new culture, one with complex and well-developed arts and science. These were prosperous, elegant, confident people. There was much to support Evans' view that Knossos was straight out of Homer. The rooms, corridors and halls of the palace merge with storage areas and meander confusingly. Following the passageways and stairwells, it's easy to see how the palace complex could have been portrayed as a labyrinth. And everywhere, there were images of bulls dominating the site. But most extraordinary of all were the frescoes that seemed to depict a bizarre and unique ritual, bull leaping. Could the legend of the Minotaur have been rooted in stories of young Cretan bull leapers? Evans felt that his faith in legend had been vindicated. He named his newly discovered civilization the Minoan, after the legendary King Minos. The realization that the Minoans had been more than myth was soon to lead to new questions and even more extraordinary answers. For at the heart of Knossos lay a mystery. The site seemed to have been occupied for about 500 years and then, inexplicably, abandoned. At the University of Reading, England, Archaeologist Sturt Manning is using scientific techniques to get to the bottom of what happened on the island of Crete more than 3,000 years ago. What exactly the demise of the Noans is is always a, a difficult question. For about 20, even 30 years, there's been a split between people thinking about a long, um, therefore somewhat slow process, and a short, quick one. Sturt's research builds upon an earlier theory about the fate of the Minoans. In the 1960s, a Greek archaeologist, Spiros Marinatos, linked their demise to an event on the Mediterranean island of Santorini, only 70 miles from their home on Crete. Around the time that the Minoans disappeared, Santorini had suffered a catastrophic volcanic eruption. In his search for evidence, Marinatos began to dig on Santorini. 
what he uncovered was as startling as the earlier excavations at Knossos. Buried beneath the earth lay a complete town. Frescoes, pots and artifacts all bore the unmistakable hallmark of Evan's mysterious Minoan civilization. Whoever the Minoans had been, they had not been confined to Crete. The town, almost perfectly preserved under a deluge of volcanic ash and pumice, bore witness to its sudden end. It was tempting to assume that such a huge eruption only 70 miles away from Crete must have spelled instant death for the Minoan civilization there too. But to establish this, accurate dating of the key events was essential. Ceramic dating of pottery from the site had put the eruption on Santorini at about 1500 BC, which corresponded to the collapse of the Minoans. But Sturt Manning is looking at more precise ways to date that eruption. He began using the science of dendrochronology, the study of tree rings, to give him a clearer picture. Well, the special thing about trees is that they give you an absolute date. So you can look at a ring and say, this ring grew in a certain year, because each year of growth equals one ring. And you can even divide that down to the early wood and late wood of a ring, so you can say, this is the spring, this is the summer. So no other form of dating available to archaeologists or scientists really gives you that type of absolute precision. In the life of a tree, a volcanic eruption is a significant event. A massive explosion like the one at Santorini releases growth-promoting materials into the atmosphere. Sturt began looking at ancient tree samples from the area and found that each did indeed show a marked growth spurt. And they showed them not around 1500 BC, but nearer to 1640 BC. That's about 100 to 150 years earlier than the conventional wisdom placed it. It was traditionally placed around 1500 BC. The tree ring evidence told Sturt that the volcano erupted at least a century before the Minoans vanished. They had survived the eruption only to disappear more than a hundred years later. To find out more, Sturt and his team are pushing the techniques of dendrochronology a step further using chemical analysis. A volcanic eruption releases a variety of chemicals into the atmosphere. Trees absorb these chemicals into their wood, forming a unique record of changes in the surrounding air. In the analysis, tree samples are first acidified into gas. Post-eruption, the gases reveal an unpleasant picture. Toxic heavy metals and minerals from the volcano poison the air. Deposits of tephra, microscopic shards of glass, would have blanketed the islands. For the Minoans, the eruption with its fallout of ash and tephra, its blackened skies and tidal waves, must have seemed like the end of the world. Somehow they survived that initial trauma, only to begin a doomed battle against its long-term effects. The Minoans' prosperity would have collapsed into a struggle for basic survival against the cumulative effects of volcanic pollution. In the end, it was a struggle they lost. The Minoans vanished from Crete and from history. They lived on only in the words of Homer, until Arthur Evans brought their buried city into the light once more. A century ago, Arthur Evans was going against the tide of archaeological opinion when he looked for truth in ancient myth. By the 1960s, the climate of scholarly thought was even more entrenched. Among the rolling hills of southwest England, 
One man took on the archaeological establishment in a long-running search for the truth behind England's most enduring romantic legend. At its heart was the question, was this prehistoric mound near the Somerset village of Cadbury the site of Camelot, legendary home of King Arthur? According to legend, Arthur was a charismatic leader who unified Britain, drove out invaders, and brought new standards of peace and prosperity to the Dark Ages. The stories told of noble knights gathered around the famous Round Table. But was Arthur real, or just a story? And had Camelot ever existed? A medieval Welsh writer, Geoffrey of Monmouth, certainly mentions a leader called Arthur in his texts. But perhaps because of its often mystical flavour, archaeologists had dismissed the story of Arthur and Camelot as a fable. But one archaeologist refused to ignore the Arthur legend. He was intrigued by the mound at Cadbury. It was known to be an Iron Age hill fort, but local stories described it as the site of Arthur's Camelot. In 1966, British archaeologist Leslie Alcock began an excavation at Cadbury. What he found was that people had indeed been living at Cadbury for thousands of years. But much more recently, about 500 AD, the mound had been re-fortified into an extensive Dark Ages stronghold. The dates fitted with those estimated for King Arthur's reign. Alcock had found an important Dark Ages site, but could it have been Camelot? Significant support came in the form of foundations for a large meeting place, a grand hall fit for a Dark Ages king. Then came a decisive find, pottery fragments from thousands of miles away, oil jars from Tunisia, dishes from Carthage, wine jars from Byzantium. Such exotic pottery was almost unique in Dark Ages Britain. Its presence meant that someone at this site had unusual wealth and power. Alcock had shown that local stories had been right about Cadbury being a Dark Ages stronghold, although no one could be sure that it was Arthur who had ruled there. Alcock's pioneering work inspired another archaeologist, Richard Tabor. When I was 10, I used to come up here and bother the archaeologists who started digging here in 1966. And eventually I bothered them so much that they asked me if I'd come up uh, and take part, which I did. And on and off, I've been doing that ever since. Working with Alcock, Richard became fascinated with the mysteries of Cadbury. Alcock's finds indicated that the Cadbury site extended further than the mound itself. For Richard Tabor, this was significant. Was the hill fort more than a military stronghold? Perhaps it was the center of a much larger settlement. Richard is finding out by surveying the area around Alcock's site. Yeah, that one back. Well. The site, um, he uses know. test pits to locate structures got, beneath yeah, the soil. And with the latest geophysical technology, he can identify which will be the most fruitful places to dig. So far, he has identified a settlement area of nearly 300 acres around Alcock's initial site and compiled this data on a computer. We're eventually building up a picture of how the landscape would have looked at different times, the way in which it's been divided up by ditches, walls. We can get some idea of what the um, economy was like at a given time. look out into the wider landscape you can see actually they had very considerable variation in resources. If we look down there now we can see water in the valley and then you've got the valley sides that would have been good for cultivation, some of them are south facing and you'd have had good crop growth there. Richard Tabor's survey reveals a complex settled area with elaborate systems for agriculture, dwellings and trade. 
Cadbury was clearly the center of a well-organized, thriving community, exactly the sort of achievement credited to King Arthur and just what the Arthurian stories described as the backdrop to Camelot. The Arthurian legend of a successful kingdom led by a strong king seems to have some basis after all. But Cadbury was not the only place linked to the Arthur legend. Tintagel, only a hundred or so miles from Cadbury. It features in the writings of Geoffrey of Monmouth as the birthplace of King Arthur. It's a wild and remote outpost on the southwest coast of England, an awe-inspiring spot steeped in mystery and romance. But the ruin we see today was built in medieval times and archaeologists believe that a small Celtic monastery was the only other thing ever to have stood there. It wasn't until a chance event in the early 1980s that the truth about Tintagel began to emerge. A summer fire burned away several layers of grass and soil from the headland. The accident revealed something quite unexpected, the foundations of dozens of buildings. The find came as a shock to local archaeologist Carl Thor. It's been found that just the concentration of buildings here is so dense, we're talking about nearly 200 buildings, that this couldn't have been a monastery, it must have been something much more significant. Clues soon began to emerge. Buried near a drain was an inscribed slate that dated the site. It's one of the very few examples of Dark Ages inscription ever found, and it confirms that this major settlement had been built in Arthurian times. The finds at Tintagel didn't stop there. Emerging from the foundations was some intriguing pottery. The significance of the pottery um, is that it shows that someone here at Tintagel was trading directly with the Byzantine Empire. Someone in Turkey or in Constantinople must have known about the significance of this place. When Karl began to look closely at the pieces, his analysis revealed that the pottery had all been imported from the Mediterranean, and it was exactly the same type as that found at Cadbury Hill Fort. Clearly, Tintagel was linked to Cadbury and not as a minor outpost. As excavations continued, the true extent of the settlement became apparent. Tintagel, if you put it all together, is probably the largest Dark Age citadel in the whole of Britain, which must have been governed by a royal person of the period. So was there really a King Arthur? The question may never be fully answered. But the discoveries at Cadbury and Tintagel paint a new and more complex picture of that time. We now know that large-scale settlements did exist, supported by organized communities, economic systems, and foreign trade links. All of this increases the probability that there was also a powerful ruler. Leslie Alcock's faith in the value of the Arthur myth led ultimately to new revelations about the past. Yet despite its unorthodox inspiration, his research relied on data gleaned from physical evidence, solid objects revealed by patient digging. But some archaeologists are looking for other ways to explain the past. Physical evidence can show what actually existed, but can science show us how our ancestors experienced their world? Rising majestically from the green vastness of Salisbury Plain, England, Stonehenge is one of the most enigmatic monuments in the world. An ancient Neolithic stone circle. It seems to generate myth and legend, as well as speculation.
It has at various times been explained as a giant astronomical computer, a beacon for extraterrestrial communication, and even a huge sundial. But perhaps the most well-established belief is that Stonehenge was built by Druids. With their animistic beliefs, colorful rituals, and ceremonies of human sacrifice, Druids provided a popular image for the site. But modern dating techniques show that Stonehenge was built more than a thousand years before Celtic Druids ever came to England. So this idea, though attractive to many, is ruled out. So what then is Stonehenge about? The problem for interpreters of Stonehenge is that there is very little conventional evidence for archaeologists to get hold of. A few animal horns have allowed experts to carbon date the site, but otherwise its past has stayed shrouded in mystery. For Dr. Aaron Watson, traditional archaeology didn't seem to be offering an explanation for Stonehenge. He began to think outside the idea that all ancient sites must have had a practical use. Perhaps they had a different purpose. For quite a long period in its history, archaeology has seemed to be primarily about describing the past. More recently, there's been a move away from this, because if we just try and describe them, we end up with a very dry, static, two-dimensional prehistory. Aaron's idea was to view the ancient world as its occupants would have experienced it, looking for clues of form, feel and sound. To understand Stonehenge's place in the world of the Neolithic, Aaron decided to begin with earlier sites. It was the beginning of a quest that was to take him all over Britain. He began his journey at Carned maybe on Owen, Wales, where dramatic outcrops have been used by humans since thousands of years before Stonehenge was built. In the simple, nature-dominated lives of the Neolithic people, these dramatic landmarks must have been significant. It's outside the everyday pattern of life. It's somehow remote, it's high, these hills are often covered with cloud, it's colder, it's windier, it's generally more inhospitable. And it's quite likely that places like this would have been invested with some kind of significance to those people, maybe some kind of supernatural importance. In this world, long before churches or public buildings, caves acted as temples and burial chambers. Rocky outcrops served as columns and portals. It was as though these ancient people were seeking out natural places that served their spiritual needs. As Aaron moved on to later sites, he noticed that, as time went on, Stone Age Britons were improving on nature, moving rocks and laying stones to create simple but stunning structures. People stop just having significance in the natural world, or what we understand as being the natural world, and instead began to build monuments of their own. started looking at the later Neolithic sites, the difference was even more marked. Construction was more extensive, although still integrated with the natural surroundings. Here at West Kennet, Wiltshire, a Neolithic long barrow or chamber is built into the hillside. Long barrows marked a major change in the relationship between people and landscape. They were made deliberately, not as dwellings, but as a stage for ritual.
but West Kennet was to prove pivotal to Aaron Watson in quite another way. While he was examining the structure, he realized it had a significant property. It echoed. The most obvious thing when you walk in here is how it changes the voice. You feel kind of enclosed by the stone, but the voice booms and, and echoes. So as you move into this mound from the outside world into the chambers, your experiences change, the sounds change. You've gone into a different place altogether. The long barrow would have had an effect, much like that of entering a major place of worship today an awe-inducing change in sound perception. Aaron began to think that these ancient sites might have been molded specifically to create effects with sound, to intensify mystical experience. He set out to test his theory with equipment that released a constant sound against which environmental changes in pitch and volume could be measured. His test subject was Stonehenge. Built 500 years after West Kennet, it's an astonishing achievement. A massive structure that must have seemed nothing short of stupendous to its Neolithic builders. Aaron suspected that its function was not practical, but dramatic. And that although there was no roof, the huge stone circle itself would have created a unique sound experience. To measure how the stones reflect sound, Aaron Watson uses a loudspeaker that emits sound at a range of pitches. Microphones are scattered around the site to register the sound after it has bounced off the stones. Results were recorded in a database and later plotted on a map of the structure. There was no doubt that the massive stones did affect the perception of sound. A computerized sound map of Stonehenge shows just how sound is distorted by the heavy stone circle. It shows that instead of decreasing in volume as it travels from the center, sound actually becomes louder as it moves outwards. The stones around the edge reflect sound inwards and amplify it. People inside Stonehenge were being subjected to sounds that they could not have experienced anywhere else. And that must surely have created a great impression upon those people, added to the importance of the site, and maybe increased its mythological status. The tests have confirmed Aaron's theory that Stonehenge could well have been an effective dramatic stage for ritual, perhaps the culmination of a trend running through the course of British Neolithic history. For Aaron Watson, understanding pre-literate societies demands innovation in ideas as well as in methods. Challenging established approaches is part of the progression of archaeology. But sometimes ideas come full circle. The Temple of Apollo at Delphi lay at the heart of a legendary Greek world of heroes, gods and goddesses. In the epic writings of Homer and Plutarch, Delphi was the center of the world. For this was no ordinary temple. This was an oracle linked directly to the gods. Here, ordinary mortals could ask for a special favor, a glimpse into the future. The remains of a Greek temple still stand at Delphi. But is there any factual basis for the wealth of story and legend that surrounds the oracle? Almost all the Greek writers wrote about Delphi, they describe it as a holy site to which thousands of pilgrims from the lowest to the highest in the land came seeking prophecies. Each was allowed to ask the oracle one question. The responses came from a priestess, 
who had entered a trance by breathing supernatural fumes. The fumes, rising from the ground, possessed the priestess, or Pythia, with the spirit of the god Apollo. It was this infusion that gave the prophecies their accuracy. The Pythia was, literally, inspired. While it was clear that the Delphi temple really existed, 20th century archaeologists found the story of the prophesying priestesses and the entrancing fumes hard to take seriously. The days of relying on ancient Greek legend were deemed to be over. John Hale, an archaeologist specializing in the history of the ancient Greeks, began his work on Delphi with just such a view. I was taught extreme skepticism was the proper stance and that all ancient sources were to be disbelieved until proven absolutely uh, worthy of trust based on a battery of modern tests. The ramp the steps With his colleague Henry Spiller, John is using all the tools at his disposal to understand what really took place on this ancient site. So here is the inner sanctum of the Temple of Apollo, the seat of the oracle. And as a visitor, you would have come in and taken your place on a bench along that right-hand side, waiting for the priest to call you forward. You would then stand, put your question to the oracle, and she, seated in a crypt, a small enclosed space on that south side of the sunken area, would then respond. As she comes into this, this very dramatic chamber, and then her whole religious belief system you know, preparing her to be possessed by the god. John carefully analyzed all the stories about the oracle. He read accounts of the Pythia's trance and how her inspiration, fumes from the god Apollo, came from a fissure beneath her feet. Yet the idea that gases could really have been sending the Pythia into trances had already been dismissed. The traditional view, we can't really call it a legend because it was presented as science and as fact by these writers who included eyewitnesses, that that view is uh, a fraud or a mistake. At the end of the 19th century, a French archaeological team had excavated the site. Finding no evidence for a crack in the earth beneath the inner temple, they had dismissed the Greek stories as myth. But John was not convinced. I just can't help thinking, since they believed that the prophecies could only happen here, she couldn't prophesy somewhere else. It was the place that had the magical, religious, spiritual properties. There must have been something about the spot itself that made it all possible. But pinning down just what it was about the Delphi Temple that had made the oracle so special proved to be a challenge. In the end, it was a chance encounter with an American geologist that gave John his breakthrough. Yella de Boer had been surveying Delphi for the Greek Geological Service. He had already plotted a geological fault across the site, a line that ran right underneath the ancient temple. De Boer had no idea of the significance of his new line on the map. In fact, he assumed that everyone knew the fault was there. I had trouble convincing him that he'd made an important discovery because he thought it was so obvious. And it was hard for me to say or to make him believe that he had really observed something that would turn a hundred years worth of archaeological wisdom on its head. John Hale and Yella de Boer returned to Delphi to resurvey the fault in detail. When we arrived at Delphi, what surprised me was exactly what Yella said would surprise me, how obvious it was. It didn't need a degree in geology to recognize that there were these exposed fault faces that were different from the rest of the mountainside. And as the pair cast their net wider, it began to look as if there might be a second fault. De Boer's fault line was indeed obvious once it was pointed out. So here at last was hard evidence that there had been more than one fault involved at the site of the Oracle of Delphi. De Boer plotted the second fault. It crossed the first directly beneath the Oracle, creating a stress point that would have caused cracks on the surface above to open and close over time. 
the fissure beneath the Pythia's seat was likely to have been reality 2,000 years ago. But what about the gases? De Boer turned his attention to travertine rock deposits around the site of the temple. They showed where springs had once flowed up from deep beneath the ground. And when Yella de Boer saw this, it was his idea that at the time when the spring was emerging at the top of this wall, it would have been bringing up along the fault line some of the gases that were involved in the prophetic procedure. If gases were coming from the active Delphi fault below, they would have been dissolved in the spring water and deposited in the travertine rock. Wanting some evidence to convince skeptics that there really had been an, un an unusual flow of gas here in ancient times and that we could give evidence of what that gas might be, we were given permission by the Greek government to take samples with hammer and chisel from this massive travertine rock. Back in the laboratory, the travertine rock was broken into pieces and then dissolved in acid to release the gases. Finally, the gases were extracted and tested. They turned out to be light hydrocarbons, vaporized by geological activity deep within the earth. One of the principal gases was ethylene. But would inhaling ethylene have had an effect on the Pythia? The team's expert was toxicologist Dr. Henry Spiller. Lighter doses it'd give you a lightheadedness, a uh, sort of a disembodied euphoria, it's a rather pleasant sensation. Um, you'd begin to get a mild numbness uh, or tingling sensation, lack of inhibition. All of this would be taken, I'm sure, by someone who was prepared to be possessed by the god as as knowledge that the god has arrived. Dr. Spiller's account exactly mirrored ancient Greek descriptions of the Pythia's intoxicated behavior. John and his team had used science to prove that the words of the ancients can't be so easily dismissed. For John, it was a defining moment. Delphi is one of the most important sites in Greece. The the fact that so many ancient writers recorded this tradition has been part of the evidence for not taking ancient writers seriously. If they could be wrong about Delphi, well, they could be wrong about anything. So this would really have implications way beyond the interpretation of Delphi. The team has shown how experts from different fields can work together to find a solution. And John Hale has demonstrated that an open mind can still be a scholar's best friend. One thing that has changed for me is the way I approach ancient sources now, ancient writings. I have gone around now to the other side, and I feel that it's up to modern science to disprove these ancient sources that, as with uh, uh, the accused in a court trial, they should be believed until you can prove them wrong. As archaeology has matured, science has developed more precise tools to find and interpret the material evidence that links us with the ancient past. There's much that may be forever beyond our reach. But as signposts and guides in the quest for understanding, legends have proved their worth. Without them, many truths would have been lost forever beneath the endlessly shifting sands of history. Mm -hmm.